in the medical humanity. For those of you attending the series for the first time, my name is Carmel Raz, and I am a member of the Society of Fellows and one of the co-organizers of the series together with Ledley, Heidi Haas, and Arden Hagler, who couldn't be here tonight. The goal of our series is really embedded in its title, Exploration. Over the course of 10 meetings this year, we've explored a truly diverse range of approaches to the medical humanities on subjects including the history of opium, Buddhist medicine, the politics of poison tri trials, and just the right way to prepare a skeleton. It's really been quite a journey, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers, respondents, and some of our regular attendees who actually are here uh, for all of their many contributions. I also want to thank our sponsors, which includes the Columbus Society of Fellows, the Human Center for the Humanities, the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, and the Center for Science and Society. So um, what we've done in the previous uh, meetings is that um, the, you, you, the speaker has spoken, the respondent has responded, then we've opened it up for Q&A. I'll chair, so if you want to ask a question, just make a mark and I'll put you on the list. Um, I'm now delighted to introduce our speaker tonight, Roger Grant. He's an assistant professor and director of graduate studies in the music department at Wesleyan University. And this semester, he's also a visiting assistant professor in the music department at Harvard. His work focuses on 18th century music, the history of music theory, enlightenment aesthetics, early modern science, and series of the affects and the passions. He earned his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and was subsequently a junior fellow of the University of Michigan Society of Fellows. His first book, Beating Time and Measuring Music in the Early Modern Era, won the Emerging Scholar Award from the Society for Music Theory in 2016. Roger has published articles in journals including Critical Inquiry, Music Series Spectrum, 18th Century Music, and the Journal of Music Theory. And he is also active as a dramaturge and has collaborated on operas and art installations. Our respondent, Professor Benjamin Stege, is an assistant professor here in the Department of Music. He studied theoretical discourses around music in the 19th and 20th centuries, with particular attention to intersections with the history of science, as well as problems in the history of hearing and listening. His research has been supported by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, the NEH, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. And his first book, Humboldt and the Modern Listener, won the Emerging Scholar Award from the Society for Music Theory in 2014. He is currently writing a second book, Music and the Limits of Psychology, 1910 through 1960, which asks what it meant for musical thinkers, pedagogues, and practitioners to adopt a skeptical stance towards authority of psychological knowledge in the context of the Weimar Republic and its legacy. So I, I'm really, really thrilled that you're both here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And Roger, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Carmel. Uh, it's <clears throat> really my honor to be here. I'd like to thank the Heyman Center and uh, all of the organizers of this Medical Humanities series, and especially Carmel for the very warm invitation. Um, and I'd like to share some of this new work with you. So, it was a quiet night, with a moderate breeze blowing, and there in the garden, I began to hear a distinct tone resembling the deep stopped pedal pipe of an organ, or something like the vibration of a deep, soft-toned bell. I could distinguish in this organ sound quite clearly a low F, and the fifth above it, the C, and the minor third above that, E flat, was perceptible as well. And finally then, this tremendous chord of the seventh, so woeful and solemn, produced the effect on me of the most intense sorrow and even terror. It awakened within me and set into lively movement all the strings and chords of a mutually sympathetic condition. Here I paraphrase Lewis, a central character in E.T.A. Hoffman's story, Automata. In this story, Lewis describes a fantastical encounter with the overtone series, or the chord of nature, as it was then called. The sounds of this natural phenomenon overtake him, producing in his body a sympathetic vibration, a sudden, gripping, visceral immediacy that he cannot explain. Now, we don't know exactly what sounds Lewis might have heard that night, what this natural harmony sounded like, but we do have a hint of the type of music that E.T.A. Hoffman thought produced that same sort of immediate transformation. Hoffman uses extremely similar language in the context of his work as a music critic to assess the qualities of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. So, just to refresh your memory. 
these measures, Hoffman wrote that his entire body was moved deeply by a nameless, premonition-like longing. The critical term for the type of experience Hoffman and his character Lewis elaborate is affect. Now, what is the story behind affect? What is affect, anyway? 21st century theorists define affect as corporeal, immediate, and non-discursive. Affect is said to relate conditions of feeling that cannot be adequately captured by the tools of language. Affect theory has recently benefited from a huge resurgence in interest among humanists and social scientists, a phenomenon variously called the turn to affect or the affective turn. Whether the apex of this new popularity has already passed or is yet to come, it's safe to say that affect has not always attracted the same attention that it does today. As the story typically goes, critics have recently favored affect theory in their search for alternatives to the focus on discourse that characterize the linguistic turn. But this narrative is not exclusive to the 21st century. It is also the story of a less well-known movement in intellectual history that occurred in the middle decades of the 18th century, when debates on music created a fundamental transformation within aesthetic theory. So this evening, I'd like to demonstrate for you that our current and popular theoretical model of affect has its origins in 18th century music theory. My remarks for you this evening are in three parts. In the first, affect representation music, I'll establish the role that affect played in the aesthetic theory of the 17th and 18th centuries. Now during this time, the affects, or the passions as they were also called, were important components of an elaborate semiotic system that explained the impact of art. Today, by stark contrast, affect is often explicitly opposed to theories of representation and of the sign. Theorists construe affect as a matter of subjective reception that is fundamentally objectless or non-intentional. The genealogy I will trace in the first part of this paper will demonstrate how affect theories became separated from representations of aesthetic objects and it will illustrate the central and surprising role that music played in this separation. In the second part of the paper, Affect Without Representation, I'll trace the non-representational theory of affect from Romanticism through the 19th century to the present day, and I'll show how 21st century affect theory betrays an indebtedness to music and to sound. Finally, I'll conclude with some brief reflections on the historiography of affect and some thoughts on method. So, to begin. Contemporary affect theories rely on a variety of sources from the history of philosophy, but by far the most important of these is the work of Baruch Spinoza. So generally, today, when affect theorists acknowledge that affect theory has a history, they discuss Spinoza's work. In the Ethics, Spinoza describes affect, or affectus, as the body's capacity to respond to the world in a pre-conscious manner that either increases or decreases its power of activity. Spinoza is committed to theorizing the relationship between the affecting object and the affected subject. So, when you see an object that you love, for instance, your body's power of acting is increased and you experience pleasure. Spinoza further specifies that the affecting object itself need not be present in order for a subject to experience an affective response. If something resembles your beloved object enough, say, an image of it, you may love that object as well, and your body's power of acting may be increased. Spinoza, and indeed many 17th century thinkers, wrote extensively on the reproduction or representation of affecting objects and their role in creating the affects in subjects. 18th century aesthetic theory built on the 17th century's theories of the affects and the passions further elaborating Spinoza's thought. Affect in this doctrine played an important role in systems of signification and representation, fulfilling a function that might seem completely foreign to contemporary affect theory. In 18th century aesthetic theory, representation referred not only to artistic renderings of objects and events, but also the mechanism by which the soul came to know the objects in the world. Representation named what was then an unknowable connection between the soul and the sensorium, and according to certain models, the soul was completely constituted by representation. 
affects resulted from re-presenting the world's external objects to the soul. The arousal of the affects and the subsequent pleasure obtained in their arousal was, as aesthetic theory saw it, the major goal of all art. So Jean-Baptiste Dubot, writing at the beginning of the century, could straightforwardly claim, quote, the principal merit of poems and paintings consists in imitating the objects that arouse real passions. The copy of the object should, so to speak, excite in us a copy of the passion which the imitated object would itself have excited. Alexander Bobby Baumgarten, often credited with naming the discipline of aesthetics in his meditations of 1735, put it rather directly when he wrote, representations are motions of the affects, therefore to arouse affects is poetic. Dubot and Baumgarten contributed to a growing body of knowledge that construed affect as an essential component in the experience of art. Aesthetic theory in the 18th century was not only concerned with the soul's responses to the objects in the world, it also aimed to specify the qualities of objects that would elicit certain affective responses in subjects. So in order for me to explain what I mean by the qualities of the objects and the objects of affect theory, I'm gonna focus on one particular aesthetic object that was a favorite for these 18th century thinkers. And that is the sculpture group Laakouan and his sons, otherwise called the Laakouan group. Now, 18th century thinkers took this to be an ancient Greek work. In reality, it's probably a Roman copy of an earlier Hellenic bronze. Uh, but they tended to focus their criticisms on Laakouan's face. Now, Winkelmann considered its relative calm to be a reflection of the noble Greek soul of its creator, while Lessing argued that the sculpture had moderated Lacoan's expression so that pain was tempered with beauty in order to evoke the sweet feeling of pity in the viewer. This transformation from an object of art to a specific affected response of a subject experiencing it constituted the basic framework of aesthetic theory in the 18th century. Broadly speaking, it was a paradigm of mimesis, or as the period sources put it, imitation. Representation and affect were two foundational parts of this basic architecture. While each theorist offered a slightly different account, the basic assumption was that artworks imitate those things in the world that evoke the affects in their beholders. So, how does this all come to work? Well, theorists describe the mimetic capability of artworks in two ways with two different types of signs. The natural sign reproduced something of the object it signified. This occurs in painting and sculpture, for example. Whereas the arbitrary sign held an abstract, pre-established relationship to the object. So this occurs, of course, in poetry. Now, just in case you're curious, natural signs are more akin to Peirce's icon, whereas arbitrary signs are like Peirce's symbols, but Peirce's category of the index is missing from this 18th century scheme. Okay, so how does music work in this theory of art? Until the 18th century, theorists had understood the art of musical tones as a vehicle for amplifying other mimetic representations. So music assisted in the mimetic work of poetry in the form of song, or of stage drama in opera, or in other types of sacred and secular theatrical depictions. Musical tones themselves were not considered proper aesthetic objects uh, for aesthetic theory. But during the 18th century, through a number of developments in the dissemination and performance of music, thinkers began to realize that the art of musical tones needed its own aesthetic language. And it was in the process of creating that language that both aesthetic theory and affect theory were forever changed. The attempts to fit music into the pre-existing categories of signification within aesthetic theory were legion. Some critics, like Rousseau, insisted that music operated as a natural sign. In Rousseau's view, music was mimetic of the first cries and plaints of primitive man, in which speech and song were one. It imitated those natural impassioned cries that were now inaccessible to humanity. Others tried to imagine music as some sort of imperfect version of an arbitrary sign. Music seemed to these thinkers some sort of ancient language for which we had lost the code. D'Alembert, for instance, likened the symphony to, quote, 
a German discourse spoken before someone who understands only French, end quote. Andre Morlay called it a language without vowels. So if music was an arbitrary sign, it was one that was nearly impossible to interpret. So you can see that music is really causing a problem for 18th century aesthetic theory, in particular for the way that semiosis was understood. But what if music was neither a natural nor an arbitrary sign? What if music was not a mimetic sign at all, but was somehow, through some other mechanism, able to create affective responses in its listeners? Over the course of the 18th century, a small number of critics had begun to suggest a non-mimetic aesthetic framework for music. The consensus in this vein of criticism was that music, instead of imitating, could bypass the traditional structure of representation through its physical reality as sound. It was said to vibrate the nerves of the listener and thereby arouse an affective response. This was a theory of affective attunement, and it is the biggest missing chunk in our current historical work on affect theory. Drawing on the ancient tradition of music a humana, in which the body and its parts are thought of as a finely tuned instrument, theorists postulated a sympathetic resonance between the physical sounds of musical tones and the inner workings of the human. As Christian Gottfried Krause explained, the soul is like a stringed instrument that sounds sympathetically whenever a tone is given that corresponds to one of its strings, even though the string itself is not touched. This view solved the problem of explaining how music managed to evoke affect in a way that none of the other arts did, and it accounted for the mediation of affect through a phenomenon, sympathetic resonance, that was empirically verifiable and a known fact of physics. Attunement, indeed, even seemed to be doing the work of mind-body mediation in the account of musical affect provided by Johann Joachim Engel, who writes, all passionate representations of the soul are inseparably linked with a corresponding vibration of the nervous system. The influence is reciprocal. The same path that leads from the soul to the body leads back from the body to the soul. Through nothing else but sound can the concussion of the nervous system be so steady, so powerful, and so diversely manifested. The theory of affective attunement had displaced earlier mimetic theories and provided a corporeal, immediate, non-discursive explanation of music's affective power. Any specificity once accorded to musical objects had been collapsed into their vibrational mode of transmission to the listening subject. If all of this materialism and corporeality sound familiar to you, it's because affective attunements are back. Once again, theorists and commentators on the arts have decided to find a way of talking about affect that de-emphasizes its long-held relationships with representation, theories of the sign, and discourse. Once again, it has become productive to offer up materialist accounts of the body's inner workings in order to bolster the arguments one has about art. But how did we get here? What occurred such that this strange, late 18th century theory of attunement became the dominant theory of affect? once again. Although the genealogy of affect theory is unbroken from the early modern era to the present day, its popularity has been far from uniform. After the late 18th century heyday of affective attunement, the discourse on musical immediacy went on to become a central part of early 19th century romanticism in the writings of Goethe, Tieck, Wachenroder, and of course, E.T.A. Hoffmann. Affect theory, on the whole, however, became less central to aesthetics and instead found that its center of gravity had drifted at the dawn of the new century to the field of physiology. So in order to understand this shift, consider the Scottish anatomist Charles Bell's variously titled book on affect, which was published in editions throughout the entirety of the 19th century. So here's the first of 1806, which bears the name Essays on the Anatomy of Expression in Painting and begins with an introductory essay on the importance of anatomy for painters. So this is basically an updated Le Brun on how to paint expressions. The second edition of 1824 is titled Essays on the Anatomy and Philosophy of Expression 
and it begins with an account of the nervous system. This second edition, which was circulated much more widely, transformed what was essentially a manual for artists into a document on the science, the physiology, of affective expression. Nevertheless, Bell did not completely omit discussions of art. In the seventh essay, for example, which begins with the relationship between respiration and affect, Bell observes that a body under attack with its limbs occupied in combat is not able to engage the chest in order to scream. He then picks up a thread of art criticism concerning, you guessed it, the Lakawan group, agreeing with critics who praise the moderation of expression on Lakawan's face, which does not show a scream, but rather a soft moan. Bell, however, came to this same conclusion in a completely different manner. Whereas Lessing, if you'll remember, had been concerned with the production of the correct affect, the sweet feeling of pity, in the beholders of the Laakwan group, Bell praised the artwork for its accurate depiction of the physiology of an affected subject. He writes, the beauty of this group of Laakwan arises from its being a true transcript of natural expression. So Laakwan here has been transformed from the affecting object, the creator of affective responses, to the affected subject, registering a response, a case study in the physiology of affect. Bell's manner of discussing depictions of affected subjects in artworks is carried forward in Charles Darwin's seminal 1886 text, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. For Darwin, as for Bell, the artwork is more of interest as a transcript, accurate or not, of an affected subject's physiology than it is as a progenitor of affects in others. And Darwin, too, comments on the Laakwan group as a transcript of the affect of grief. Darwin's text was, in turn, a major source for Sylvan Tompkins, who has arguably become the single most influential affect theorist of the recent past. Tompkins attempted to update Darwin's system with even more detailed studies of expression in the face. He writes, in short, affect is primarily facial behavior. For Tompkins, as for many 21st century affect theorists, affect is non-intentional and objectless. It is both something that happens to the body and something that can be read upon the body. But this body is always the body of an affected subject. Theorists no longer attempt to describe anything positive about the affecting objects that generate these responses. The most fascinating aspect of our current situation is that we have returned to affect theory in studies of the arts, while nevertheless maintaining an avoidance of discussing the qualities of affective objects, a theoretical situation first generated in the dilemmas of 18th century musical aesthetics. While 18th century theorists had trouble construing musical objects as either natural or artificial signs, 21st century theorists attempt to avoid discussing discussions of semiosis in their assessment of all art objects. The commitment, generally held among affect theorists of the past two decades, is to concentrate on the immediate, precognitive aspects of aesthetic experience, and to elaborate the corporeal and material conditions of their operation. Signification in these theories is understood as a subsequent cognitive assessment of that visceral immediacy. It is not discussed as a property of objects themselves. This is what gives Simon O'Sullivan license to claim affects can be described as extra-discursive and extra-textual. Affects are moments of intensity, a reaction in, on the body at the level of matter. They occur on a different, a-signifying register. In fact, this is what differentiates art from language. Discourse, text, signification, and language are here all conflated and construed as affects others. While 18th century theories of affective attunement responded to a crisis within the theory of mimesis precipitated by music, 21st century theories respond to a need for alternatives to linguistic turn era thought. Frustrated with the then widely held dogma that discourse shapes and underpins every human activity, theorists at the turn of the 21st century felt as though their accounts were incomplete. They struck out to identify and describe 
those autonomic processes for which cognition comes too late. In so doing, they initiated a new strand of affect theory, or indeed an entire affective turn that shares much with 18th century theories of affective attunement. Both are committed to deciphering aesthetic experience, but attempt, for rather different reasons, to avoid the attribution of aesthetic power to the signification of aesthetic objects. They draw, therefore, on similar resources. These theories emphasize the role of the body, concentrate on the physical and material properties of aesthetic experience, and make use of what the science of their day can explain about transference, mediation, and the mind-body relationship. They champion the immediate, the drastic, the automatic, the indescribable modes of art. No wonder, then, that these contemporary theories of affect sound so musical. Resonance and attunement remain powerful models of, of mediation with physical observable corollaries in the natural world, and they have therefore retained a figurative place in the language of affect theory. So we still describe individuals as high-strung or low-key, possessing a bad temper, referring to their temperament or their tuning. This wording is derived from the music of humana tradition and disseminated through music theory. But the correspondence is not only figurative for contemporary affect theorists. Several of the authors in this tradition use music and sound in paradigmatic or explanatory ways. Gregory Siegworth and Melissa Gregg, on the first page of their influential volume, The Affect Theory Reader, locate affect in, quote, those resonances that circulate about, between, and sometimes stick to bodies and worlds. Or for Lauren Berlant, the transmission of noise performs political attachment as a sustaining intimate relation. Or consider the work of William Connolly, who writes, media mixtures of noise, rhythm, image, concept, and music touch the infrasensible register as they also convey conscious judgments. That register, again, precedes, augments, or intensifies the others in something like the way the subaudible vibrations of organ music infuse the composition of moods without themselves being felt. The content of this passage could well have come from a romantic author like E.T.A. Hoffman, in whose writing the low, organ-like tones of the harmonic series induce affect in the protagonist Lewis. Now, whether, Connolly, uh, whether or not Connolly is explicitly aware of this intellectual legacy is, for me anyway, less interesting than the renewed relevance of music noise, sound vibration, and attunement as explanatory mechanisms for affect in the present day, operating very much as they did at the height of Romanticism. So just some brief <coughs> concluding thoughts on method. In many ways, we've returned to E.T.A. Hoffman's scene in East Prussia in the company of low, vibrating, and deeply meaningful overtones. There are plenty of obvious reasons to be worried about this development in the humanities. The way, first of all, that it seems to grasp for a solid hold on the real, as though vibration and material had some extra purchase on existence that ideas and significations do not. Or perhaps the way that this kind of affect theory has reinscribed what Amy Simony calls a crypto-dualism in its celebration of the body, the immediate, and the sensorium, and its concomitant denigration of thought. Or even the way this line of thinking, in its Hoffman-esque romanticism, hints toward an older model of musical transcendence that we thought was no longer a part of the discourse on music and feeling. So you could be worried about any of these things if you're paying attention to contemporary affect theory, but actually I think we have the tools to combat these worries, to combat the crypto-dualism or musical transcendence, so on and so forth. What I'm concerned to investigate and to expose is something that I think we have not yet understood which is the structure of events in intellectual history that has created these parallel historical turns away from representation and toward affect. The reason, I'd like to argue, that we haven't yet fully understood the repeating return to affect is that we haven't yet understood affect dialectically. Affect emerges as a concrete entity only when it's been doubled through a kind of estrangement or opposition in the form of theory. The two make each other possible. Affect on its own is an elusive experience that resists the capture of description, 
It is said to be a nearly indescribable state of feeling, for which our tools of rationality are inadequate. And so, as a result, we use the supreme instruments of rationality, especially the taxonomy, in order to describe it. The supposed indescribability of affect, its non-discursiveness, its immediacy, only fuels our attempts to describe it. But despite our best efforts, our theories of affect always appear to be lacking something. They might seem somehow incomplete or inadequate, or they might not match up with other scholars' accounts given of the same phenomenon. Just think of how every contemporary affect theorist today has a slightly different definition of affect. And so affect theory, through its various attempts and its contradictions, therefore bolsters the notion that affect is indescribable and uncapturable. And the entire process is in position to repeat. The opposition between affect's drastic immediacy and affect theory's calculated Gnosticism is mutually reinforcing. So there is something dual in the nature of affect itself, something that we attempt to capture but that refuses to be captured. What I would like to suggest is that this is not just a synchronic duality nestled within the concept of affect theory. It is also the structure of a diachronic unfolding within the history of ideas. First, affect is said to provide an important explanatory tool for theories of representation in art. Affect is a component of the rational explanation for art's power and takes account of the objects that stir the affects and subjects. Affect explains the power of the sign. But as affect theory evolves and the challenges of capturing affect are played out, theorists begin to contrast affect with rationality, with language, and even with all of signification. Affect becomes non-discursive, purely corporeal, precognitive, or opposed to language and the sign. Affect is said, again, to be ungraspable, even while we continue to try to grasp it. So as we enter a new age that prizes materiality, that is newly fascinated with affect and is suspicious of representation, let's remember the structural dualities that are part of this story and that continue to spin themselves out historically. <coughs> let's remember that this non-discursive, non-representational theory of affect is not new and that its origins might be musical. Thank you. to Roger's uh, thoughtful and stimulating talk in a couple of ways, um, not so much one after another, but sort of mixed up. Um, basically, uh, both by focusing in my comments on the historical uh, span he's spoken in some ways the least about, which is the one between the 18th century and the, um, and the 21st century, um, and then also just by, by posing um, uh, some, some questions that come to mind. Um, so I, I hardly need to preface my comments by noting that the, the tasks of writing a genealogy and excavating origins are notoriously tricky. Um, even if we grant the lack of uniform investment in a particular problem or figure of thought, such as that of affective attunement, it can remain unclear what the nature of the historical continuity might be that we wish to observe, especially over a span of, of centuries. Um, so if the turn to affect is in fact a return, what kind of return is it? Um, is it a rediscovery of a potentiality that had always been present but went to ground for the intervening generations? Um, in other words, a resurfacing of something that had been theoretically possible without being actively theorized in the years between, say, Hoffman and, and uh, Masumi, by Masumi, as if one had suddenly remembered the answer to a question that had forgotten one knew. Um, or is it in fact the case that there is an unbroken continuity of theoretical commitment that merely went through phases of waxing and waning popularity? Um, I think there is yet another third historiographical possibility beyond either rediscovery or re-acknowledgement. Um, and I'm going to hazard a guess that Roger's approach allows for or, or even hints, at this pos hints toward this possibility, especially when he's just suggested in conclusion that um, affect emerges as a concrete entity only when it has been doubled through a kind of estrangement or opposition in the form of theory. Um, and so what, what I think this third option is, is um, a finding a recurrent break from the status quo, something like the more familiar idea 
that one can imagine feeling modernity like a particular sort of narrative structure. Um, that structure can be reactivated and varied any number of times, such such that the break from, say, the organic to the mechanical could be said to be characteristic of the experience of any number of historical situations from at least the 17th century to the present. Um, so even within a single life story, such a break from, from feeling that one's life is organic and suddenly becomes <coughs> mechanized in some way, that sort of structure could be felt to recur indefinitely without losing its sense of impact and the creation of novel effect. So that example of the organic to the mechanical switch is something of a historiographical cliche, and the move that Roger is narrating is, is less immediately available for a neat packaging, but could perhaps simply be said to be the recurring situation in which musical sound constantly presents itself as constantly presents itself as threatening to undue representation and unleash affect. Um, in other words, I wonder whether Roger would go so far as to say that there has been something like this background recurrent break that only intermittently emerges in the form of theoretical discourse, but nonetheless always persists in historical experience, um, even if it's not acknowledged as such. Um, and if so, might one be able to tell its story by means other than the intellectual historical, um, or in addition to? Um, uh, to put the question slightly differently, um, one of the bugbearers of recent affect theorists, um, especially the ones Rogers highlighted, um, is intentionality. Um, but I'm wondering whether it would be possible to imagine a sonic or musical history of affect that nonetheless um, highlights not just a series of, of intermittent theoretical reflections on the problem, but rather a series of, let's say, technical situations um, or possible, possibly techniques of listening um, that would participate in the bringing out of unrepresentable affect. Um, if, if we allow that the musical encounter with affect can't be fully describable, would it nonetheless be possible to specify at least some technical conditions under which it, it might come to the surface, affect might come to the surface as being problematic? Um, I don't have any brilliant ideas about what that might be like, um, but I mention it because I'm struck by at once seeing the commonality of the 18th century aesthetic discourse with the contemporary moment, while also wondering just how to characterize this kind of continuity. Um, the gaps between, say, Bell or Darwin and say, Sylvan Tompkins or, or William uh, Connolly are somewhat disconcerting, yet I imagine there must be some way to, to, um, to flesh out the narrative, and I know Roger has ideas on this, flesh out the narrative without relying on just the explicit textual traces of where, in other words, where affect pops up as, as, as a highlighted term. Um, and, and so, I mean, one, I, I said I don't have any brilliant ideas, here's, here's kind of a bad idea, but were I to, to venture down that path, the, the one thing that comes to mind is, is just to hone in on the unusual significance for Masumi of the temporal gap between affect and thought. Um, in critiques um, of, of Masumi, um, some, some of the critiques that emerged in the last uh, decade and a half, um, this, uh, this temporal gap between affect and thought, always being slightly behind your own um, affective uh, intensities, um, is explained away to some, to some extent by showing how he misinterprets experimental psychology, the experimental psychology he, he'd been reading that dating from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, yet there's actually a, a deep prehistory to this notion of this gap, um, going back to the mid-19th century, um, as amply documented by in work by historians of science like Humana Canales and Henning Schmidtgen, among others. Um, might the, the particular historical situation of musical sound play some role in, in that narrative? Um, I, I don't know. Um, Focusing on the encounter with affect as a component of cultural technique, um, similar to what uh, Roger has already brilliantly accomplished for the experience of, of meter and timekeeping in a, in a similar, slightly earlier historical framework, would be a way of both acknowledging affect theory's deep distrust of intentionality without allowing it to slip fully into the realm of the historical, as, they some, as, as the theories sometimes seem to um, admit. Um, and it might also allow for some more sustained reflection on the problem of transmission of affect. Um, in other words, as the problem has been described by some theorists, how does affect come to adhere to particular things, music for instance, uh, in ways that even if to some degree ineffable, remain shared and, and recognizable. Um, and then I would just end with one sort of broader question, which is um, just, uh, 
I wonder if you'd be interested in, in commenting on any sort of parallel, um, is, is, there, is there a parallel phenomenon between the shift in historical relation between sciences and humanities in the, in the sort of the decades around 1800 and the present that has somehow led to this, um, to the sudden kind of emergence of affect as a problem? Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, or is, or is, or is, would that sort of parallel not be so easy to, to, to specify? Um, that's, that's what I'll stop. Thanks, Robert. Fantastic. Ben, thank you so much for that incredibly generous and really generative response. And I want to first begin by speaking about what you called this third approach, right? You know, the, the idea that there could be uh, this recurrent kind of um, I don't know, possibility within music always that's threatening to break away from representation and, and you know, perform pure affective you know, transmission. And I think that that's very much true and that it's been true at least since the 18th century. And I would wonder about anything before that moment within the way that music is theorized aesthetically, only because I think that in the 18th century for the first time, musical tones themselves are considered an aesthetic medium. That is to say, they're not simply the live soundtrack to some other mimetic representation that's occurring basically in the context of song. So I've, I've taken here a kind of Gary Tomlinson view that before 18th century discourse, music was essentially cantological. It was understood basically as a species of kind of song. Even music without words, that it was understood as, as this kind of uh, that, that it was amplifying other mimetic representations. And so there, I think, music and musical tones, once they're conceptualized as, a, as an aesthetic medium that needs to be theorized, they really do cause a crisis within the theory of representation, because they seem not to be able to fit into any categories of science that 18th century theorists have at their disposal. And really, um, uh, compelled by Tom Torino's work with an ethnomusicology, uh, which draws on Persian semiotics and finds an incredible amount of productivity in Peirce's category of the index for music, which of course is exactly the category that's missing from 18th century aesthetic theory. So I would say that once that shift occurs within 18th century thought, within 18th century aesthetics, that musical tones need to be given treatment under aesthetic theory, then that temptation is continually possible from, from that moment to the 18th century through to the present day. The question is why we have been drawn to and repelled by it at various moments. Uh, and so I can understand the situation within Enlightenment aesthetics that you know this, this is a, a problem for the taxonomy of, of signs. Within the 21st century, there's also a crisis in the theory of signs. And one could even call it a kind of musical crisis. That is that art and the way that we want to theorize art seems inadequate suddenly to the category of the sign. And I would say that that is the parallel crisis in the 21st century that's led us to, if you will, a kind of musicalized version of affect theory. But yes, I think very much that, that tendency or, or that potential to, you know, that potential that it's kind of I don't know, um, a disturbance that lies beneath all discourse on music is very much something that you can account for um, continually in the, in the intellectual history of uh, writing on music since the 18th century. So I'm very inspired by that notion. I also wish that I had the time in the book that I'm writing on this topic to account for all the period intervening between the 18th century and the present day. And I can do a little bit to say how I think that affect theory has gone underground and is associated with physiology and physiognomy, yeah. even. Um, but what's fascinating is that now, in the 21st century, we've, we've inherited all of those strands, you know, Tompkins drawing on Bell and Darwin and, and a number of other 19th century theorists, and, you know, psychology, you know, developing this non-intentional theory of affect. So we are inheriting that tradition and now we have brought it over to theories of the arts, once again. And so it seems to me fascinating 
that. This is prefigured only basically by this weird crisis in 18th century music theory, uh, which, you know, the documents of which are not, you know, very readily read, right? I mean, not, not really around, not getting much press. So, so that's my attempt to kind of draw these two into dialogue with each other. But I'm very inspired by the notion that, in fact, this is a deep continuity that's nestled inside of most discourse on music that's there as a kind of potentiality waiting to explode above the surface. Um, I'm also very interested in this deep prehistory of the temporal gap, which I'm unfamiliar with, and I definitely want to know more about. Um, and it seems also to me that, of course, you know, temporality is a major question for affect theory because the temporalization of the affective experience seems to lend itself to musical models. Since music, if you construe it as vibration, right, is pure transmission, right? It's mediation for free because everyone understands that you know, sympathetic resonance is a known fact of physics. So that's one reason I think that we're drawn to a kind of musicalized discourse inside of affect theory, because we need models of mediation, right? Um, I'm also really curious and had not contemplated a kind of formal parallel between the 18th century and the present day in terms of relationships between the sciences and humanities, except to say that in our current moment, we're very much engaged with being scientifically aware humanists. That in the moment of the post-human, we are looking to various kinds of sciences in order to inform the critical discourse that we're offering. That, you know, science is measuring calamitous changes around us that we are of necessity engaged in. And if that looks like Enlightenment academies, where members like Johann Georg Solzer or or Jan Fleet Kierner wrote on subjects in what they call natural philosophy, you know, science, empirical science, and bell letters at the same time. I think I find that actually quite inspiring. There, there's certainly something there. Although, I'm not sure that I would underline it as particularly unique to those two moments. But there is a kind of conviviality or the idea that we're inspired by drawing from the other side, that indeed, Within the person of a single scholar, work can be done across these fault lines. That is something that we're invested in in the present day. And that is very much a kind of enlightenment notion. So I'm incredibly inspired by that, and it's something that I want to write more about. Um, yeah, I can't thank you enough for this incredibly generous response. Um, yeah. Great. Well, we have some time for questions. Um, Lauren, please go ahead. Thank you so much. This was really interesting. I'm I want to confess that I'm coming at, I came to this because I need to know more about Africa here and the philosophy of emotions. And one of the things that was really striking to me that I'd love to hear either of you or you say more about is this problem of intentionality from contemporary Africa theories. And the reason I'm, I was struck by it is because the people I work on think you can have intentionality without representationality. And so it's a question to me why, so is there a worry about any kind of aboutness, is problematic aboutness, or is aboutness that takes us discursively, or is it, is there something specifically that's linking intentionality in the contemporary affect theories that you're working on with a kind of, specific kind of representationality? Anyway, can you help me understand the, why is intentionality a bugbear? Right, yeah. yes, and it seems to me, and Ruth Leis has actually written most uh, eloquently on this situation in terms of contemporary affect theory, and it's borrowing from the field of, of psychology uh, and and philosophy, which is which is you know mixed in with uh, the you know the discourses that uh, psychology is offering us. So what what Lays proposes and what what seems to me to be the case is that many contemporary affect theorists have conflated intentionality with concepts that seem not equivalent to it, like semiosis. Uh, or even with something like ideology, right? And I think what's happening is that the method, affect theory as a methodological impulse, is meant to be an alternative to traditional forms of ideology critique. And so, because that's happening, there is a slippage between intentionality, signification, language. These things seem to be equated together. Right? So language, of course, you know, a, a highly specific form of signification, one that really only involves the category of symbol, right? Uh, or mostly involves the category of symbol, and yet is equated with all of semiosis, 
Uh, so, so the goal is for these contemporary humanist affect theorists to create a kind of objectless, non-intentional affect theory to provide some kind of description for what occurs before consciousness intervenes, right? Uh, so meaning, in this case, right, um, is something that occurs after the affective transformation has occurred. Signification is then construed as a sort of second step after an affective transmission. So this is, of course, all, you know, theorizing what's occurring in the affected subject. And, you know, from my bizarre 18th century perspective, I'm kind of wondering, where did the objects go, right? Um, and what would it look like if we returned them to affect theory? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Alex? Thanks. I was really, really enjoying that. I think just as a general comment, it's really interesting to have it in the same paper a sort of reminder of the, the utility of the relentless fetishization of things through a sort of discussion of how problematic and brought out relationships that things are. Mm. But, but it's accompanied by a reflection on the sort of policy of critique. It's a, sort of a way of engaging with our, our effective states. So that was a tremendous thing I want. Um, I've got two questions in my opinion. Um, the first is to returning to the idea of medical humanities. Mm. I mean, one hypothesis that you could offer for why uh, musical theory gained such a kind of dominance in discussion of affect in the mid 18th century is related to the emergence of the idea of the body as an entity which is characterized by continuous voluntary vibration, right. tracking sympathy from the terrain of, 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 of pneumatology and pneumatics, for instance. Um, and so I was wondering if, if you might be able to highlight some. I think of some other ways in which the body is being conceived that might be, you know, and helping to facilitate or engineer or make a video of our own problems. I think that would be interesting because there are those, certainly those resonances if you forgive the pun. Yes, yes. Secondly, a term which which kept on coming to mind all the way through for me was was uh, the teleology. Mm. And I felt mm. that the reflection of the term teleology might also help in Previous question: the way in which um, you know language and, and, and signification and intentionality get lumped together on this kind of broader category of purposiveness, which, when dominant, somehow can just steamroll that bent and explain that bent and why it's not really dominant. You know, and sort of cast aside and sort of decide what that bent is something intrinsic in purposeless and pretty dominant. So those are my two thoughts. That's fantastic. Yes. Um, I'm very interested in the 18th century theories of the body that sort of allowed affect theorists to create the theories that they proposed. What's really fascinating to me, and another interesting parallel between that moment and the other, is how shamelessly theorists in both eras steal what they'd like from the science of their day and, and transform it. Uh, so Joseph Hartley, in Observations on Man in 1749, observes that indeed, you know, the human body is made up of solid nerves along which vibrations travel. So this is you know, a, a very productive realization and one that affect theorists are keen to expand upon. However, in the work of the affect theorists in the 18th century, this suddenly becomes the nerves are vibrating in sympathy with tones of music as though they were stretched strings. So this is a complete transformation of the idea of what vibration is. Hartley, of course, writes, it's ridiculous to think that your nerves would vibrate like this, you're not strung like a veal, but this doesn't stop affect theorists from positing that we're vibrating sympathetically. So what's interesting is that if the discourse is there in the science of the day, then affect theorists are ready to use it as a theoretical tool. Now, unlike Ruth Lays, I'm not really invested in the scientific validity of contemporary affect theory. I'm certainly not interested in the scientific validity of 18th century affect theory, so why would I be interested in today's affect theory scientific validity? But I am interested in the fact that there are this, these parallel creative transformations that occur where a, a notion or concept or figure is then transposed so that it fits the model that seems convenient for aesthetic theory in order basically to accomplish or, or you know, overcome a problem within the aesthetic theory of that day. So I definitely want to learn more about that and it's part of one of the chapters of the book. Um, so the second question about teleology I find also really fascinating. 
And I can't help but wonder, well, tell me if I'm answering your question correctly. I can't help but wonder if, since affect theory has been with us for this incredible amount of time, it's not going to disappear ever, and that we're going to continue to play out its dilemmas in some kind of a dialectical fashion uh, without any kind of crowning moment in which we've decided that its operation can be explained. So the promise of its unexplainability is sort of the motor on which it runs. And I think that the idea that there could ever be a definitive notion of its explanation would defeat the purpose of affect theory in a certain sense. That it needs to alternate between the uncapturability, the, the absolute unutterability of this experience, and then the heavy reasoned taxonomic att attempts to try to specify it. Yeah, and I think that's right. I have a lot to say, perhaps, in response to that. Uh, to try to forget 30 seconds. No, take your time. Um, <laughs> um, but what's kind of interesting is the middle of the 18th century, there's a moment where the status of that, the non purpose of quality of affect, is particularly problematic, precisely because theology is so deeply embedded in our theory and theology. Right. And then it's as well. And what's kind of interesting is the moment we're coming out of it, we want it to be sort of rude and reductive. Oh, I see. Is that we've been applying a sort of critique which assumes that the purpose of a representation is something which determines its affective properties, if you want it to be meaningful. Right. No, I no, I think that, that I think that there's a lot to that. Yeah. And I'm trying to mount a critique through a kind of genealogy. Um, and also hoping to make a contribution to affect theory to continue to its, you know, so that it can continue, you know, living life. I, I feel like, you know, I'm not going to be the, I, I'm not going to write a genealogical critique that will stop people from theorizing affect. I, I certainly um, don't have that mission. But I do hope that perhaps in learning some kind of lesson from this specific historical moment, there might be a way of generating an alternative mode of theorizing affect. Yeah, definitely. Over here, yes, please. Hi. So, <clears throat> from psychiatry, our discourse is very different. Um, so I'm wondering, in discussing affect, how do you differentiate or integrate notions of affect and emotion? Like, what do you do with that? Are they similar or are they very different? Yes, this is one of the most important questions for contemporary affect theory. As it's been practiced in uh, many humanities and social science iterations in the recent past, there's been an attempt to divide affect and emotion from one another. So the, the generally held assumption following people like uh, Eve Sedgwick or Brian Masumi is that affect is the non-discursive, impersonal, autonomic process that occurs too quickly for you to notice it. Emotion is the subsequent cognitive assessment of that phenomenon. Uh, and so that, that comes from you know, a number of different genealogical sources. Uh, it's derived from, from Sylvan Tompkins on the one hand, inspired by William James. It comes through Deleuze and Guattari, and it's most explicitly articulated in the 90s by people like Brian Masumi and Eve Sedgwick, and then the assumption kind of operates from there. That said, there are contemporary affect theorists like Cyan Nye and Jonathan Flatley who don't want to distinguish between affect and emotion in that exact way. Interestingly enough, this, for Cyan Nye, means that in the introduction to her fabulous book, Our Aesthetic Categories, there is enti an entire section on judgment that is almost neo-Kantian. This I find fascinating. So if you don't accept the distinction between affect and emotion, all of a sudden, you put into operation some of the same Kantian questions that the 18th century asked. I think this is actually quite fascinating. Uh, but many theorists today in the humanities do draw that line and say that you know emotion is the subsequent cognitive assessment of that immediacy. If I can complicate that. So, theory theorists, well, theory, not theorists, theory empiricists, will talk about the fact that um, if you're in the forest and you step on a snake, this is, you will, your, your, your foot will come off the snake long before you're able to process the visual information that it's a snake. Right. And so now just to throw that in, <laughs> so they will have a motor action, which just seems very fast. But you would have to say it comes after the affect, right? Because it 
I think that they want to describe that motor action as being part of an affective response. I think that that is the contemporary affect theorist position on that, on that precise situation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. David? Um, wow, there's a, for me, there's, a, there's an awful lot to, to wonder about. I, so the question about emotion was one that I was going to ask because I, I misunderstood actually what your topic was because I'm completely unaware of this new affect theory, which seems to be talking about an experience that is not what normally, what, what used to be meant by affect or affection. In the 18th century, affection still means the emotions, does it not? And am I wrong about that? Well, so I... When one talks about, when one speaks of the passions or the affections, aren't these standard examples still anger and, and um, grief and, and uh, bliss and so forth? Or right. Am I wrong? Right, no, 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 you're absolutely right, yes. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same tradition that picks up those theories of the, of, of the body's reaction to the objects in the world. And then, in the context of music theory, runs into this incredible problem of signification, <coughs> since music seems not to do a good job. And then you get this the... corporeal, non-discursive, right, exactly. Yes. Maria? The moment you seem to be reaching for is the sensation of the sublime. So, yeah, I think um, that the sublime is really, really uh, a fascinating experience because it involves multiple affective phenomena, right? There's, uh, there's fear and terror. It depends, of course, on whose formulation of the sublime, right? But there's, um, there are subsequent assessments of the pleasure that accords from the experience of the sublime. Um, so I think of the sublime as a highly troped uh, sort of experience of emotion that attends perhaps an affective phenomenon, but uh, at least in its, in its classic Kantian formulation, because it has a moment of awareness of itself, that I would think, at least in the terminology of contemporary affect theory, would have to fall under the category of the emotions. Well, Seneca defined the sublime as the transcendence of completeness. Well, there. I mean, that sounds a little Take bit. It from there. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Seneca. That's great. Um, speaking of, of troping, I was wondering if you if you had come across any other La Laquan uh, interpretations between Bell and Darwin, and if you hadn't, what kind of a character would you imagine they would take on as a flat of those sixty-year gap? I haven't found any La Laquan interpretations between Bell and Darwin. Um, there are a lot between my interlocutors and Bell. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pain Knight, um, there's, there, the, the, the debate is a classic one, right? Um, but I, Bell is the first time that I see Laquan being treated as a depiction of an affected subject, that is the sort of case study in affect. Um, and the reason that I move from Bell to Darwin is simply because Darwin draws so heavily on Charles Bell. Uh, and seems to, Bell seems to him to be one of the few theorists that, you know, was productive. He, you know, apologizes that he didn't understand the evolutionary process involved, but nevertheless is picking up specifically on lots of his discourse. And so it appears to be like a very clear connection for me. I would imagine that between Bell and Darwin, physiology is still the most important component of theorizing affect. And that's how we arrive at the moment in Sylvan Tompkins of saying that affect is primarily facial behavior. This to me is really interesting because it's a depiction. We're suddenly talking again about a kind of image, but it's an image of an affected subject rather than an image, let's say, of a beloved, right? Like that, that might generate a response to you in the Spinozistic kind of formulation. So I wish I had more and more citations for you that connect these two, but I would imagine that it's it's very much involved in physiology in between them. That's fascinating. It's almost like um, Bell was good. His explanation was good enough that people sort of left at for yeah. <laughs> for a while. Um, Walter, please. I, I wanted to come back briefly to the historical moment you began with, with that amazing detail. <coughs> 
there, more ambient in nature, and then that becomes the, you know, and then he even references, I believe, a kind of physicist named Richard, Johann Richard, and he mentions, and then, but, and I'm, I don't know how this, because this is a specific historical moment, but since you began with it, in terms of music and nature, the sounds of nature, and the sounds that were transmuted into these musical forty, at least in this movie, I was just wondering how you think about that. And I think Hoffman is a really splendid place to turn because the music of nature seems to him to, to it, it, it repeats as a trope and as a figure that it's, you know, this is the most perfect music somehow, right? The, the chord of nature is somehow underwriting in these stories an affective transposition that must be the most true. And in our present moment, in our turn to the physiology, the autonomic processes of affect, there is a certain way in which we want our theories of art to grasp a hold of what we know about the nature of the human body to explain something about the, you know, the most true explanation for aesthetic experience that we could ever arrive at. So I think in both of these, in both of these eras, nature is kind of underwriting a sort of truth, or is underwriting a kind of authority. Now that certainly is nothing new, right? I mean, that's a, you know, a trope that we see in scholarship of all times. Uh, that's a repeating kind of tick. But what's fascinating to me is the particular way that sound, resonance, vibration, all of a sudden, these, just like in Hoffman's literature, have animated new theories of art in the present day. Yeah. Um, over here, and so. Um, yeah, thanks, Roger. Um, I'm wondering to what extent uh, theology plays into your discussion of this. Um, because I know 18th century theories of affect are deeply rooted in, you know, um, higher uh, sort of uh, discussions in, within theology about the nature of God and sort of the Newtonic resonances between man and God. Mm. Um, so is there, I guess, a sort of, uh, is this a, sort of uh, discussion important to the work that you're doing and is there then a kind of modern correlation between what affect theory engages in the theological it's really interesting. I think, you know, there certainly in 18th century aesthetic theory, morality is a huge component. So the fact that art has to be didactic, that it has to be morally improving, that it has to show you how to be a good person, this is actually one of the most important figures that gets music into trouble. Because music is really bad at being didactic. Uh, one of my authors says, no one ever said, what an informative music, right? Um, so, uh, so there's definitely the figure of morality. Um, it, in terms of the figure of God himself, there, this is an operational principle for some of the theorists that I'm discussing in the early modern era, and it's not in the theories of the 21st century. However, um, a kind of if you want, panpsychism that animates Spinoza is in fact what's animating a lot of the return to materiality. You can say that in the work of Jane Bennett, you know, rocks have feelings. There, there is a kind of panpsychism that's been reanimated in our contemporary moment, in our turn to material for a kind of productivity. So I would draw the parallel somewhere around there. Um, and I would wonder, what our relationship with material and the material world in this moment of crisis, you know, why in particular it's drawing on that earlier kind of Spinozistic moment. I would draw the thread in that manner. Um, yeah, I haven't written explicitly about this, but you're encouraging me to. Mm -hmm. um, so, one thing that occurred to me while you were speaking, uh, you briefly raised, I think, the question of uh, the relationship of natural sciences uh, to, you know, to the humanities and so forth, uh, both in the 18th century and, and now. So I'm, I'm not going to talk anything about now, but in the 18th century. I was kind of surprised, and, and I just throw this out as a general question, I was kind of surprised that you didn't mention your mom. Oh, right. Uh, because, of course, you know, since music theory is part of part of the uh, of the ground of the covering. And um, it, it puts me in mind of one of the places in Rameau where he does actually make an attempt to, and in fact, a considerable length, and I think with some success, 
to use a particular version, the, the latest version at the time, the 17, early 1750s, of his harmonic theory uh, to explain the, uh, the affective effectiveness uh, of the, the Lully recitative enfant puissance from Armide, which he had already written about um, in the Nouveau Système in 1726. He comes back to it in 1754, and this is in direct response to Rousseau's um, letter on, on uh, French music and, and all of that stuff that's going on around the Cadeau uh, uh, de Buffon. And um, he finds a way to, in effect, show how the, um, the, the I mean, Rousseau complains that the, the rich dative is awfully bland, right. in effect. Right? Yeah. Uh, Ramo says, oh no, you're, you're missing all of the, the wonderful ways in which the, these very subtle but nonetheless real shifts of, of um, tonal center, tonal emphasis, uh, somehow capture by, as it were, a kind of analogy to capture the, the emotions of the protagonist of Ami. And um, that's a kind of way of, of incorporating a, a sort of semiosis. Uh, directly into the music itself, which I don't think anyone else had done. And Rameau offers it as a, as a rejoinder, uh, a very strong rebuttal uh, to uh, Rousseau's, which of course by this time was, was under development, his theory of music as an analogy of what you might call pre-linguistic human expression, or human emotional expression, or affective expression, right? right? Um, which is also a semiotic theory, and which is also based on the idea that music is essentially analogical. And I think every theory of music's expressivity, or I shouldn't say expressivity, but semi semiotic potentiality that, that I'm aware of, is in some way treating music as, as portraying, or uh, depicting, or en enacting a kind of analogy of the, of the emotion that it's representing. Um, so there is a background in the 18th century of this kind of thing, which is seems to me to be going in a rather different direction from what you were talking about. So, yeah, can you yes, talk about that? I I can't thank you enough for that uh, question. So this this talk is drawn from the introduction to my book. The first chapter is basically all on that exchange between Rameau and Rousseau uh, <laughs> concerning the Aristotle's <laughs> teeth. Um, so uh, in the first chapter of the book, I talk about this earlier moment in 18th century music theory, which I'm calling the mimetic affect in Lara, in which theorists do posit these correlations between formal musical materials and intended affects. And so you have it in Matheson uh, taxonomies, uh, for you know what the different affects, how they might be portrayed in music. You have it in Heineken's Thoroughbass Treatise as a prescriptive discourse for how you ought to set bland opera texts. This is how it actually comes out in Heineken. Well, you know, you can depict the situation this way or that way. In the exchange concerning the Lully recitative, enfin, il est en ma puissance, you have two theorists utterly committed to different versions of their own mimetic theory and they find, within the same piece of music, utterly different things. So one of the things that this pronounces to the quarrel about musical signification is that there can't be a definitive answer. While one person hears mimetic representations of definitive affects, the other hears no. And this quarrel is happening at the same time that a third option has been trotted in. This is all happening in the context of the Carrel de Buffon, a debate about Italian comic opera and serious French opera, and it's at this precise moment that the figure of attunement is brought in more or less to solve these problems, since there can't be a consensus on whether music could be mimetic in this kind of way. Um, I think it's a fantastic debate. Other people have disagreed that it might be one of the first moments of music analysis. I think it very much could be one of the first moments of music analysis. It's one of the first places where a specific piece of music is being treated to detailed, detailed close reading on the case of two individual theorists. So yeah, I'm very vested in this moment. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, Eamon. So as a musicologist, for somebody invested in music, I want music to have had the jump, like to have seen some problem ahead of everyone else. But I wonder, and this is really just like uh, a more advanced form of photobiotism, but I trust you thought about it. And what about other senses, like objects, contemporary theory of objects? Can you find similar 
responding to the mechanisms on the housing residents, you know, to account for that kind of thing. You know, things that would make music seem less special. <laughs> right. Especially on this question of residents. Yes, that I had very much looked for. I wanted there to be an 18th century debate about resonance in the theory of sculpture, for instance, or theory of dance. I was very excited to figure out what was going on with dance. But mimetic theorists are very happy to understand their various art forms as being either natural or artificial signs in the 18th century. So. Uh, and there's a lengthy reason, there's a very complicated reason why musicologists don't, are very uncomfortable with thinking about a break from the Mises during the 18th century. Uh, it's uh, long ago was associated with historiography that propped up the notion of absolute music, but I think that that, you know, without endorsing that narrative, there, there's a way in which we can actually pay attention to the utter confusion of theorists in dealing with musical tones during the 18th century. So here I do have to agree with M. H. Abrams uh, when he says music, uh, you know, music was the first art that was severed by a critical nexus from the traditional theory of imitation. That I, I think really, uh, because because music poses this problem of ab abstraction um, and offers as a figure the physical reality of its sound vib vibration as an answer to that problem. So I hadn't found resonance and attunement in other the in, as, as explanatory mechanisms for other theories of the arts. Um, I believe it shows up in Lessing. Uh, yes. There's an authenticating factor in the discussion of whether uh, the reaction to tragedy right. uh, are merely vicarious feelings or they are authentic feelings. And then he distinguishes pity from the other emotions that can be elicited in tragedy. And except for pity, everything is mere vicarious. Right. And then he explains the authenticity of pity or empathy, mm -hmm. middle of it, uh, in terms of the resonance vibration model, where he distinguishes all the other affects in tragedy are right. uh, the vicarious ones, they have resonance uh, vibration, whereas pity, the string is directly in Right. Yeah. That, I think, is really fascinating. And then there's an, is another passage I can send it to. Oh. In the uh, epistolary exchange between Mendelssohn and Lessing, um, where, again, it has to do with an authenticating factor that distinguishes the object from the mimesis, oh, okay. and their affect is involved. Oh, wow. It's in their letters, Nikolai, Mendelssohn, and Lessing on, again, on tragedy. Yeah, that's excellent. So tragedy would be the place to look. Tragedy is very interesting in terms of kind of media discussion. Yeah. And questions of performance. Right. Um, Alex, and then uh, the gentleman in front of him. So just uh, my, my suggestion, the thing is perhaps to, to, to look for resonance. You know, sometimes there are things which are very similar to resonance but aren't. Mm -hmm. like with the four Hogarth's analysis of beauty, with, with the, oh. the, right, the, the vision is the potentiality of motion inscribed into an object. Mm -hmm. And also, what's, what's so fascinating about the analysis of beauty is how it has this kind of perverse materialist formalism, which is, is you know, gesture towards so much in the mid century music theory as well. So but the line of beauty is a kind of a, a corollary to vibrative motion. And what's also oh. interesting I think about, about the analysis is the way it leads so heavily on the physiology of dance. Mm -hmm. And there I think there are a couple of things and I've got references in my mind that I'll just show it to you later, you know, where there, there are some suggestions there about the kind of vibrative motion of the body that needs to be organized such a way as to produce emotional uh, elegance. Um, so yeah, and Christina wrote so interesting in the analysis as well, and there's some things there about uh, core muscular motion as well. Oh yeah. Which Completely. Yeah, Diderot's main player in in um, yeah, in the body of the book, definitely. Yeah. The question is more of a thought, so music therapy is widely accepted as a lot of 
you see uh, Mozart is superior to Beethoven and to the books and Or do you think all oh, music is a cumulative family to expect him to sound? It seems to, well, personally, although I, have, I don't have authority to speak on this question really, but it does seem to me that we have our own emotional investments in many different types of repertoires that are historical, that have to do with our previous experiences, and that have to do with the associations that we've built with those repertoires over the course of our lives. And so it does seem to me that, you know, in situations where a therapeutic response is the, uh, the, the intended outcome for musical listening, that this needs to be deeply engaged in each person's personal experience. For me, Mozart would do it, definitely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, I think it's a beautiful note on which we can conclude <laughs> a really scintillating discussion. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, the, the medical humanities, it's going to continue next year, but in a different format. So right now.